Hey, Commander, uh, how come you're here and out of uniform? I'm about to have a conversation with Marshall. Marshall Julius? The guy who co-wrote Masters of Makeup Effects? The very same. I haven't been able to put it down. I love it! But he loves practical effects and, well, look at us. Look where we live! Mouse, just because we're digital nutters doesn't mean we don't appreciate practical know-how, nor will he turn his nose up at digital magic. Great! We'll get out of your fur. Good luck. Cheers. Hey, Commander Fennec here, and I have the great privilege of being able to chat with Marshall Julius, co-author of Masters of Makeup Effects. Marshall, it's so great to see you, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, I'm a big fan, and uh, yeah, bring on the questions. Let's have them. Okay. You have co-written an amazingly well-crafted and detailed book, focusing on the creativity and effectiveness of practical makeup effects. Do you think they're better than CGI? I've been thinking about that a lot lately. In the book, we talk about that sort of push and pull with uh, makeup effects and, and CG. And I think that for a few reasons, things are kind of going back towards the practical. Uh, part of that is um, because I think uh, CG, there are some things that CG is really good at and other things that practical effects and makeup effects are, are very good at. And I think that they finally realize now that they should work together. Like when um, Howard did uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Mr. Tumnus, James McAvoy from The Waist Up, was all practical makeup effects. But from The Waist Down, with his little fawn legs, those were all CG. And it's like, and that totally works, you know, when you, when you actually combine the two. So I think it's when the two work together that, it, that the thing really comes alive. But I suppose, you know, you just can't beat, for me, a good practical effect the thought of it actually happening in front of your eyes instead of it being that sort of magic trick as opposed to being a full cg thing which is less of a magic trick and more like a video game but uh, i think it's best when they both work together you see i'm sort of on the fence about it <laughs> but uh, yeah i mean like, you can't beat a good practical effect oh absolutely there's something pretty unique about them i know you've done a few short videos in your time have you dabbled in practical makeup effects yourself for them or for other projects? When I started working on the book, I said to Howard, because I don't really know anything about practical makeup effects, not really, I mean, not in terms of actual practically doing them myself. I said to Howard, do I need to uh, read up any making of books or any how-to books? Or he said, no, you know, you will learn everything you need to know when you're doing the book. And, and he was right. I mean, I, I still have no idea how to do any practical makeup effects. But, uh, but I, I understand more the theory than the practice. That said, last Halloween, um, I asked Howard, you know, I was right in the middle of writing the book, right in the thick of it. I was presenting a quiz at a local cinema and I said to him, have you got any ideas for like, I want to, you know, I want to go in like costume or I'd like to go with some sort of prosthetic or, you know, can you give me some advice and he said Look, i'll send you a bunch of uh, 3d like transfers which are basically you know just exactly what they sound scars you just stick on your body and then cover in blood and he gave my wife a tutorial on how to apply them to me so my head was covered in scratches and bites and i looked like i'd been gored by a werewolf and i turned up to the cinema to do this event and uh, just covered in blood and tears and scratches and bites and um they didn't bat an eyelid. <laughs> so you wrote this with Howard, but you said in your intro that you pestered him for 10 years to get this book done. That's some patient determination. Many would have given up way before then. What kept you going? It's funny, a lot of people ask me for like advice when we were doing our LA signings of the book, and it's like, well, I'm not in the film industry. I can't give you any advice in, in, in that respect, but it, if working on this book taught me anything, it's the power of stalking. <laughs> so, so I always knew that it would be a really great and interesting book and a really fun, good time for me. And I know something that, that Howard really wants to do because Howard, like me, is a huge movie fan, something that all these makeup effects uh, movie nerds are. Uh, whether they work in the industry or, or just fans of, we're all sort of bonded by our love for that sort of stuff. And so I, I knew that he always wanted to, as a legacy thing, create a, a beautiful movie book. And that that's something that we could do together. So it was like, I knew that it would be good. I couldn't just let it go. And so every six months or so, whether we talk much in the interim or not, I would say to Howard, so um, 
are you ready now? Should we do it now? Should we talk about it now? And he'd be like, well, you know, I'd like to, but I'm doing this film with Mark Wahlberg or I'm, you know, doing this film with Anthony Hopkins or Tony. Yeah. <laughs> and he'd be like, well, what can I do? It's like I complain that Howard's having this amazing Oscar winning, glittering 800 movies on IMDb uh, credits uh, career. It's like, what can I do? You know, I'm just a nerd sitting in his bedroom, tapping away at his computer. I always had faith that at least it was worth trying. I couldn't just say, oh, well, you know, never mind. I'll just give up. It's like, it's just not in my nature to give up. It's like, I think if Howard had taken out a restraining order, then I would have stopped. <laughs> well, that explains what you said in your intro, that the pandemic was the opportunity to finally do this. Everyone was at home, not working. So did you call Howard and say, it's now or never? Well, I, I would never say never. I, I'm not very good at ultimatums. But yeah, when the pandemic happened and the lockdown was announced in LA, and I knew that everybody, everybody was home and, and all film production stopped. It was like, this is a silver lining to, you know, horrible situation. I mean, it seems a bit glib when I go pandemic, you know, kind of, yeah, it worked out for me. But, you know, people will say that it's nice that there's some some good came of it. And, and yeah, I, I said, let's chat. We had a talk. We said, you've got time. I know you're not working. Nobody's working. The people we want to talk to aren't working either. You know, now is the perfect time to do it. And he agreed. And within half an hour, we were already texting each other ideas for chapter titles and who we could speak to and stuff. And it was like we were just away. And this was months before we got a contract to do it. We just knew that we had to strike while the iron was hot and make the most of the time that we had. And and we just did it. You know, Howard was like, yep, you're right. This is the time to do it. And so it was like the power of stalking, my friend. What can I say? <laughs> well, just don't tell that to a judge. <laughs> now, your book was not what I was expecting. I thought it would be full of detailed info about how you do various practical makeup effects, but it's not like that at all. Instead, it's a much lighter read full of wonderful anecdotes from a group of highly creative people why did you choose to do it that way? Well, um, we were never interested in doing a making of or a how-to because there are plenty of books that already cover that. Also, we didn't want to write something that excluded um, out, you know, people outside of the industry. We wanted it to be for people who were fans and love films. We talk a little bit about the process, but not in a way that would exclude people. It's more about inspiration and fun part of the reason that this came about was that howard would talk about you know his adventures with me over the years everybody that we spoke to had wonderful stories and we wanted to collect uh, a collection of those you know i felt very privileged to be part of this process to be interviewing these amazing artists and to hear very unguarded interviews um, about their lives and their careers and where they came from and how they started. And uh, I wanted for people who read the book to feel like they were privy to those conversations too, you know, that they were that they were there, that they were sitting and chatting. And, and like, you know, like if you have a good conversation with somebody, you're not going to remember everything they say, but you're going to remember three or four like good, amusing stories, the thing that make you smile. And those, those will be your takeaway. Mostly, we just wanted to capture the fun of working in a fantastic business. You know, our book, it builds a picture. By the time you get to the end, you feel like you have a good picture of the, the whole history. But it, it, it's just been given to you in with like, uh, you know, candy. It's like, here's a candy. Here's yes, candy. that's exactly the feeling I had when reading your book. And some of those stories resonate so much with me. Oh, there's one in particular from your second chapter where these artists explain how they got into the business. That's my favorite chapter. And especially Kevin Yeager's story, when he gave his film to be developed to the woman in the drugstore, and she opened it, exposing it, and instantly ruining three weeks of stop-motion animation work. I know. I know. A nightmare. A nightmare. And that's why he said that after that, he decided to go for makeup effects, because they're more immediate, and they're not something that you have to develop over several weeks that somebody can just ruin. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's... There are some crazy stories in there, but you can just tell it's so relatable as well, because a lot of us grew up that way. It's just they, these guys were committed and lucky enough that they were actually able to pursue their dreams, you know. Relatable to people like us, maybe, but the younger generation most likely would never have to deal with that practical nightmare with everything being digital. Do you think aspiring artists have it easier? It's easier and it's harder for the kids of today. Because back in like Howard's day, the generation of monster kids who we focus on, they were almost had to be detectives. There wasn't so much information available, you know, like they would get Famous Monsters magazine or Fangoria 
and they would look in the background um, when occasionally you would go to the makeup labs of various luminaries and they would see what stuff are they using you know is it, you know what materials are they using how are they doing that you know what do the molds look like and they would actually piece it together nowadays there is uh, just no end of information you you just you know do makeup effects type that into Instagram and there's a million accounts with people doing you know tutorials and, and Rick Baker is very hard working retiree he's making stuff and it's showing you how he's making it you know there's Stan Winston studios show you how to do everything I mean they totally lift the lid on all the magic and uh, yeah you have to you know you have to join the course if you really want it but it's all there all the information is there it's all available now but because of that I suppose there's just a lot more competition so swings and roundabouts. I had many lifting of the lid moments myself when reading your book, like The Incredible Shrinking Woman. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that movie as a child and I totally thought the gorilla was real, but your book makes it clear it wasn't. That was Rick Baker. That was Rick Baker in his own suit. Yeah. Yeah. I was totally fooled by that at the time. And I'm wondering, was there anything you saw back then which you thought was absolutely real? I used to think that everything was real. I just totally believed everything. You know, I was just a complete, I, I never thought about behind the scenes stuff. I, you know, when I was six years old and I started watching Tom Baker's Doctor Who, I had no concept that it was an actor or that it was drama. I, I just thought... I thought it was real. And this was reinforced by my dad had a chain of uh, clothes stores. And the last one that he opened, he actually got Tom Baker to be the celebrity uh, guest who, who generated all the publicity. And Tom Baker didn't turn up as Tom Baker. He turned up as Doctor Who in full Doctor Who costume. So there was me in my head thinking Doctor Who is real. And then my dad, you know, says, oh, I've invited Doctor Who to come to the shop. And there's me at six, like, okay, well, there's Doctor Who. And, and they even had the TARDIS there. So it was like, so I was like, said to my brother, see, see, you know, it's clearly real. So it's like, I believe that everything was real. Your book is full of amazing stories, like the one with Ian McDermott in full Star Wars Emperor makeup, minutes before a shoot. He sneezes and his entire face makeup falls off in his hands. <laughs> That's cool. I love that story. It shows the ingenuity of these people, able to fix a pretty disastrous problem in no time at all. How many of these stories did you or Howard know of before starting work on your book? No, Howard says that actually, you know, although the, a lot of these people had been his friends for decades, that um, through the process of doing this book, that he discovered lots of things that he didn't know and heard lots of stories that he hadn't heard. Of course, he did know many of them and directed us towards them, whereas a journalist might not necessarily, you know, even know to ask. That, you know, Howard's like, well, tell us about this or tell us about that. And, you know, he would get there. But also, you know, each of these interviews that we did were like two hours plus. So we had a lot of time to discover stuff and for people to just like, oh, you know, actually, I remember this, remember that. You know, I mean, you, you talk to people and about their first films. Um, they're used to doing shorter interviews where they have to get straight to the, the work that they're talking about now or the things that they won their awards for. But you go back and you talk about the early days, you discover all sorts of crazy stuff. One such crazy stuff I learned was about The Shallows when the director wanted more blood to ooze out of a wound which hadn't been planned, mm. and the makeup effect woman... That was Tammy Lane. Tammy's amazing, yeah. And she said, give me 25 minutes, and she came up with a makeshift device that worked, ready to be concealed and shot. Mm. Most effects are planned beforehand, of course, but sometimes some great ones are made up on the spot, just like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And Tammy's, you know, incredibly creative and, and, and fast thinking, really quick on her feet. And on the one hand, she had to protect the makeup because it was like she knew that if this was if this was set in the fourth hour or the seventh hour of the story, that, you know, suddenly Bate Lively couldn't be more or less scarred than she would be in the scene before and stuff. So she wants to keep the continuity. But the director did want a scene where the character is like trying to sew up a wound and they needed blood and, and, and they had planned for it. And so she just created a blood, a blood bladder out of nothing, out of nowhere. But that's what, you know, that's what they live for. These guys, you know, it's like, yes, there's a certain, there's amazing artistry in spending a long time preparing something and planning something. But I think the real excitement is like the director saying, you know what would be really cool is if we do this or if we do that. And, and it's like, they, they just love that. They live for that stuff, honestly. And they're so good at it because they're creative artists, but they have a fantastic technical knowledge as well. So, you know, if you can dream it, they know how to make it. And they have 20 different ways of doing any one thing. So it's like, if you, even if they don't have the things that they need, 
they'll just go to a target or somewhere and they'll just grab some stuff off the shelf and they'll create this amazing effect that will people will go wow that's incredible not having any idea that you just spent like three dollars in a woolworths for something you know puts my guy to shame eh? <laughs> they are macgyvers that is absolutely exactly accurate yeah i have learned so much reading this and i also appreciated that you didn't shy away from showing a few examples when things didn't go smoothly although this wasn't about makeup effect failures, but more about difficult actors or stubborn directors. Well, you know, I realized early on that this was going to be um, a, a book uh, celebrating the industry and very positive. And I, you know, I'm I'm a positive guy. I, I, I want to celebrate things. I'm not. I don't want to be, you know, down about anything. Um, so it, there's no real dirt. There's not a lot of mud slinging. Even when we tell stories, we're sort of careful not to. Um, we're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not trying to make it awkward for anybody else to find future gainful employment in the uh, makeup <laughs> industry, basically. But um, there are, there, you know, there are some great and classic stories like Ken Diaz's physical brawling with Mickey Rourke on, on the sets of various films. And, uh, that's, you know, it's kind of has been documented to an extent, but not, I think, to the to the extent that we, we covered his story um, in our book um you know in every profession there's going to be uh, some stormy days and uh yeah we wanted to capture that in the same way that we you know wanted to capture you know everything else so it was not something that i was shied away from i mean originally as a journalist you know kind of thought oh it's just going to be full of juicy stories and people slag each other off but that's the sort of british uh you know kind of uh muckraking uh you know then that we weren't actually interested in doing you know but we had to have a little had to have a little flavor of it you know you needed a bit of seasoning um we don't want to pretend that it's all flowers and sunshine i need to ask you a question as you know i'm a huge star trek fan and i know you talk about john chambers who created spock's ears yet i couldn't find any mention of michael westmore the guy who worked on the next generation ds9 voyager and enterprise creating hundreds of aliens for the franchise don't tell me you lost his number. Well, we do have a fair few artists who worked on different uh, Star Trek shows and movies, and so Star Trek is represented. Um, a lot has been written about the Westmores. Um, so, it, and, and believe me, there were there were plenty of people who we haven't spoken to because a, if we spoke to everybody in the industry, nobody would be represented. We only had like seventy thousand words to fit everyone else in. Every new person coming into it meant that, you know, somebody else would lose a story. So it was like there was only so many people that we could include. And secondly, we want to save some people for Masters of Makeup Effects Volume 2, which uh, we've started talking about. So it's like, so, you know, so fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, anybody who you thought, why weren't they in the first book, um, will be there in the second book. Oh, wow. I can't wait to read that one. Me neither. I just have to write it first. <laughs> Now, to finish, and just for fun, which is your favorite Stan Winston effect? I should probably say, uh, like, more of a makeup effect. Yes. But I, I, I like the Terminator robots. I like the exoskeletons. I, I love the Terminator exoskeletons, the T-800 inside, you know, Arnold's body, all that. And that is just a cool-ass robot. I just love that. That is probably my favorite. And then maybe, the you know, Predator. Oh, Predator's my favorite. He was so organic and... I think it was the best alien I'd seen at the time. Oh, it's great, yeah. And we got some good stories about the design of it and stuff, uh, the fishnets and, and everything. Nothing is an accident. Everything is the result of, you know, kind of passion and inspiration and, uh, and hard work. What about Ray Harryhausen? Oh, the um, Cyclops from Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, I guess. Uh -huh. I just, uh, I love that he, like, traps people in a little cage and tries to, like, cook them on a fire. I, I just thought it's very sort of practical. And, and real so i you know i love that i love the the crab in mysterious island because especially at the end where they managed to tip it over into a hot spring and they basically cook it you know unfortunately they didn't have any butter on the island otherwise <laughs> then that would be really delicious for myself i love the skeleton fights those were amazing oh yeah yeah I mean, again in sinbad and then um in in, in jason and the argonauts yeah i mean that stuff is spectacular jason and the argonauts fight is the most technically wowing sort of thing that i think for me that harryhausen did but in terms of sort of personality 
um, I, uh, for me, I, I, it doesn't get any better than the uh, than the Cyclops and uh, John Chambers. Oh, uh, well, it has to be you know Planet of the Apes. Oh, that just course. excited my imagination so much when I was a kid. Such a wonderful film and still excellent to this day. And I never look at it thinking there's humans in there. And uh, you know, I, I don't care that they've had more realistic looking apes in later incarnations. The CG series is, is spectacular, and now that is some good. Uh, computer generated effects absolutely flawless i mean nothing could come close to the original planet of the apes movie for me you know get your stinking paws off me you damn dirty ape it's <laughs> like well, nothing's better than that nothing oh yeah nothing that was fantastic and finally out of all the movies you've seen all the special effects which to you is the one you feel is the best if you're talking about my all-time favorite makeup in a movie uh -huh. then then um, with all due respect to everybody else, it, I, I would say it has to be the uh, transformation um, from uh, American Wealth in London, you know, Rick Baker's transformation. And we got the story of that in the book from Rick and from the director, John Landis. I was so happy to get that because even knowing how they did it, it's just spectacular. That scene when he's in the well-lit sitting room and he changes really painfully into a werewolf is for me i don't think that i think that is the most magical you know few minutes of cinema i just think it's spectacular so when you're watching it the first time you're not thinking oh my god those special effects are so clever you're thinking bloody hell there's a guy turning into a werewolf in front of me but then when you watch it 12 or 50 times as i have <laughs> then you then you can take a step back and you can and you can really watch it and you can admire the sort of amazing magic that went into it I guess that's why our, our book, it's just about enjoying, uh, uh, but also appreciating the sort of the magic in all the films that we love, really. Oh, absolutely. And that's why I enjoyed it as well. My own favorite is John Carpenter's The Thing. Mm. And your book revealed an anecdote which made me laugh so much. When the effect guy asked Carpenter how he's going to get the scene past the censors, uh, the one where the doctor's arms get ripped off, and Carpenter says, don't worry, it'll get through. And it did. And years later, he asked him again how he managed it, and he admitted, well, I never showed the censors that cut. Yeah, he just, like, left a few bits out and yes. then just put it in after it had been approved. I mean, yeah, I mean, the sort of cowboy um, aspect that you could never get away with these days, but it's, <laughs> you know, just got to admire it. And, yeah, I mean, I would say that the chest chomp scene when the guy, he loses his hands in the chest and then the body breaks apart, the head comes off and turns into a spider, into the Norris head spider. I mean, that would be, that would be my number two effect. And in, in many ways, it's even more elaborate than the uh, American werewolf scene. Um, and everything in that film is absolutely um, a miracle. Well, that was Rob Bottin, who was, you know, Rick Baker's apprentice. It was a small group, you know, back in the day, you know, there were, a handful of like uh, you know uh, in incredible people but they open the door to you know the next generation and the next generation and there's something that's wonderful about makeup artists is that uh, ever since dick smith who did the exorcist saying if anybody asks me i'm going to tell them how they do it you know i'm going to reveal it i'm going to encourage people i'm going to nurture the next generation not try and guard everything for myself that there's this openness to the industry. I really admire that, that they're really always encouraging in the next generation and paying it forward. And, you know, this was how Howard got his start working with um, Stan Winston and Rick, and Rick Baker and, and, and Tom Savini, uh, you know, who were generous with their time and generous with their secrets. And that Howard does the same for next generations. And we include in the book people who Howard gave us their, their start to. You have absolutely. Your book is full of stories where the old god were only too happy to help out the next generation. There's this exuberance to want to share what they've learned with others, and this definitely comes through. Mm. I've thoroughly enjoyed your book, and I hope many other movie fans will too. As you said, it's not about makeup, it's about the joy of creating magic. Best of luck with your tour. Thank you very much. You know, we've got some London things coming up, which we're very excited about. If anybody's interested in um, finding out about you know, any of our events coming up um, or want to buy a nice Master Makeup Effects uh, t-shirt, then it's just uh, mastersofmakeupeffects.net. We started our own official site so that, you know, there's one place where you can go for everything. Well, thank you, Marshall, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I really appreciate it. Cheers. How did it go? It was a lot of fun, Gigi. Gigi, when you're done, can I borrow your book? Abaddon, you can borrow it whenever you like. All right, let's get back to work.
computer, and program.